Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to week six. I can't believe how fast timing, uh, time is flying by, okay? Um, and we're taking this journey together, and this week I'm very excited to have Matt Wilkins with us today. Um, he's going to be uh, uh, giving us an overview, case study overview, uh, through his initiative uh, and company, Galactic Polymath. Uh, met Matt, let's see, Matt, maybe, what, a year ago or so? You know, yeah, just, a bit more, I think. Yeah, well, virtually, and we connected, and it's been fun co coordinating with you, writing grants together, and now um, you're serving as a mentor as well. Um, and so I'm really excited to um, get to see where uh, Galactic Polymath is, and and, uh, and for the trainees as well. Um, this is a, a chance for you to see something um, that is under construction, right? Um, in product, in, in development, right, Matt? <laughs> Um, and then next week, we'll take this further and we're going to dig deeper uh, uh, with Pete Volbrecht's um, uh, project and his published papers on his project as well. So um, I'm hoping this will be useful for you as well. As you know, please feel free to ask questions throughout. It's perfectly fine. Drop it in the chat, raise your hand. Um, Matt, I will pass it on to you. Welcome. Awesome. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. And thanks, Fanny Welfare. Um, offering me this time slot. Um, yeah, so this is very much a work in progress. And uh, like many of you, I am just um, feel like I'm flying by the seat of my pants constantly and trying to figure things out and construct the road as I take a step forward every, um, every day. So uh, I hope that, you know, I can provide some clarity and um, maybe prevents, <laughs> prevent some mistakes that I've made. Um, but um, yeah, like Fanyol said, um, ask me questions. You can interrupt me, um, whatever. Um, this should be uh, useful for you. So, um, okay. So who am I? Um, I'm a biologist. So I have about 12 years of experience uh, publishing in ecology and evolution. Um, and I'm a science communicator as well. Um, so I founded the SciComm conference at the University of Nebraska during my first postdoc. Um, so this is, uh, I think some of you here have been to that conference, which was virtual this year, obviously, like everything. Um, and I think it, it's in its fifth year now. Um, so it's still going, uh, which is just extremely gratifying for me. It started out as a symposium that I hosted as a postdoc. Um, so I have a lot of lessons learned from, uh, from that endeavor, if anyone's curious about that. Um, <clears throat> I've also written for Scientific American um, and made videos, some of which have won some very small uh, film competitions. So I've dabbled in um, science communication in multiple formats. Um, and I bring up this award um, primarily, well, to brag a little bit, but you know, you have to be your own marketer. Uh, it's a big, big lesson in being an entrepreneur. Um, but also because um, if you're not familiar with ARIS, the uh, Center for Advancing Research Impact in Society, this is an important network to tie into. So they have a, a newsletter that ha you know, has a lot of university um, and broader impacts, you know, people who care about outreach. Um, so this is an important network to, to connect with and they do have awards. So they, they're starting to recognize outreach and science communication as you know, this is a growing, this is a larger and larger hat that scientists are being encouraged to wear. Um, and so this is sort of trying to professionalize the systems of recognition for that. So if you, um, I mean, it's worth applying for. So, um, so two years into my first postdoc at University of Nebraska, I realized I don't want to be a professor. Um, and so, you know, I was, you know, getting involved with this, you know, SciComm conference and like, connecting people around the university who, you know, we're all trying to raise um, science literacy and engagement, um, but didn't know each other. So there's this incredible fragmentation in the science communication world. And there's just a total lack of structure um, for professional development. Um, and SAI is obviously, you know, trying to um, be one of the, the important uh, groups and fixing that and providing some structure and funding for people who want to do outreach. Um, but, it, you know, at this point, it's largely just a, you know, choose your own adventure and kind of figure it out. So I embarked on this, this journey and part of it was informed by um, this sort of framework for thinking about the problem of science, of the lack of science literacy. Um, and, you know, if we think about 
um, you know, what our audiences are for science communication. Um, most of our money and time for dissemination is focused on translating new knowledge about our universe for other peers. And, you know, so this is in the form of the, the megalithic publishing, you know, Elsevier and uh, Wiley Blackwell, you know, this whole universe of things that most people don't know it exists, let alone can they, you know, access and understand it. Um, you know, there's of course popular science outlets out there um, and under, undergraduate classrooms are an important, um, you know, large uh, audience for, you know, for outreach. You know, if you're a professor, for example, you have access to that. Um, but, you know, the, these are relatively, especially like popular science article readers, you know, there's a huge proportion of the population that can't understand the science section in the New York Times, let alone seek it out. Um, and, you know, after school and informal education, um, you know, they're, they're, basically this is where a lot of science outreach gets relegated but simply because we don't have, you know, especially starting out, you know, you're not trained at all to write for popular science. You're not, um, and you certainly can't connect to K-12, you know, as a scientist. Um, and so a lot of us do outreach and, you know, go to museums and stuff. Um, but you often are limited to like single day large events like a science fair or, you know, just kind of a low temporal connectivity. You, you don't have the ability to build relation, lasting relationships and to convey information over a longer time and, and attendees don't get grades. And so, you know, they don't necessarily pay attention or, or gain the kind of impactful um, experience that you might want them to. Um, and that is not to say that all of these things are not extremely important because they, they all are. But, you know, um, as I was kind of studying the, uh, the whole system uh, for communicating science, I recognized that there is no structure for connecting to K-12 classrooms. Like if you're a scientist and you wanna get in the K-12 classroom, you have to build those relationships yourself for the most part. Um, there are some outreach, uh, projects, a lot of, you know, NSF funded things, but like by and large teachers don't know about them, like things like data nuggets, um, where you can contribute a data set um, to this repository. Uh, a lot of teachers have no idea those exist and, and they mainly function around the universities where those broader impacts are funded. Um, and so this is the connection. This is the bridge that I decided I wanted to um, spend possibly the rest of my life working on. Um, so I started on a career transition, um, uh, you know, trying to figure out like, how do you connect with students? Like basically like, you know, I had only been in the middle school as a student. So I didn't really remember much about that because I think a lot of us uh, try to push those memories away. <laughs> but, um, you know, basically for the last three years, um, for the last three years, I've been a resident scientist at uh, two middle schools in Nashville, public schools. Um, and this is through the um, Co Collaborative for STEM Education and Outreach, uh, which is uh, a center at Vanderbilt that's about 16 years old, I think. Um, and so, so they actually have a large number of postdocs um, that work in middle and high school uh, levels at, and either on campus uh, with Vanderbilt or deployed at school. So like my, my uh, resident scientist position is a postdoc through Vanderbilt, um, but it, it um, requires me to be on site normally when there's not a pandemic uh, five days a week. And so I'm you know, teaching classes, uh, working with you know, grades five through eight um, and you know, co-developing lessons with teachers um, and it's been an incredibly enriching and interesting <laughs> and eye-opening experience and a crash course into uh, the wild west of public education in the United States. Um, and all of that said, um, if you're interested in, in learning more about this, um, or if you're interested in, you know, in possibly seeking this, um, a postdoc at the CSEO, there are always postdocs coming up because they're typically one year positions that renew every year. So um, mine is actually ending in February, which I'll get to later. Um, but yeah, you can work, like I say, in grades five through 12, there are a variety of programs and um, feel free to ask me questions anytime if you're interested. 
Um, so from my experience, countless conversations with teachers at school that I've worked with and 40 plus interviews with teachers and administrators around the country, I've found that you know, current published lessons are too abstract and or rote, they lack rigor and or accuracy, are not active, are not creative, um, and often they are not relevant or memorable. Um, and I think this, this certainly jibes with um, my experience growing up. And I think probably a lot of people have a similar um, experience with um, public education in the US. So if you ask teachers what their favorite education publisher is, they usually say me for all the reasons we just said. They often just create their own stuff. So let's do uh, just a thought exercise. So think hard. Remember a professionally published K-12 school lesson that changed you. And if you're thinking of something, which I am, it is probably the result of a creative teacher and not a publisher. Now think about a video game, movie, or book that changed you. And it's a lot easier to think about examples, you know, that come up routinely in our daily lives of these, you know, types of entertainment. And that is, I would argue, because movies and video games and, and even books, you know, come with a million dollar budget, up to hundreds of millions of dollars of budgets. And you have up to tens of thousands of people working on those projects for, you know, half a decade. Um, and the whole purpose is to escape. Whereas you think about like the unit of education, which is a lesson is often created on a shoestring budget or no budget by a single person or a small team in basically no time at all. Sometimes, oftentimes the night before. Um, and this is supposed to prepare every citizen to fit into society and function, make good decisions and, you know, uh, plug into the workforce. So I would argue that, I mean, we all know there's a lot of problems with education, but one thing that doesn't get talked about is content. And I think it's time to invest in education content. So why is content so bad? Because we all know that there are researchers, nonprofits, government entities, and sustainable brands that want to get knowledge out to the public. I mean, just relevant right now, vaccines, climate change, cancer risk, green energy, but I mean, the list goes on. They can't do that, as I kind of alluded to before, because traditional publishing largely um, determines what teachers can teach and students can learn. So, um, and something that I sort of understood, but kind of came to understand more clearly recently is that traditional education publishers sell to districts, not teachers. So um, they make these kind of high level sales that make sense for their um, scaling their business enterprises because increasingly we are, um, you know, basically our entire education system is founded on capitalism. Um, you know, basically because of these high level decisions, content only needs to sound good. The administrators don't necessarily care. I mean, this is cynical, but it's kind of true. Um, the, the, you know, district superintendents don't necessarily care if it is good, they only care that it sounds good and they can, you know, um, use it to brag about their accomplishments in that quarter. Selling to districts also widens inequality um, and rich districts can buy more. So, you know, in central Tennessee where I'm working, um, you can have a, on average $3,500 less per student per year. You think about what can $3,500 per student buy? That is a lot, that is a huge difference. Um, and so that means fewer subscriptions, fewer uh, resources, workbooks, you know, and, and often a lower quality overall. So what's the alternative? How can we improve education content and increase access to it? How can you thread those two needles? I argue that you can do this by funding education on the production side to achieve the outreach goals of clients. So this is why I founded Galactic Polymath, which is an education studio, which is a concept I'm trying to pioneer that's equivalent to an independent gaming studio um, or you know, other creative studios. So we translate any body of knowledge into creative, high production, open access K-12 lessons to achieve outreach for our clients. So how this would work is, um, Basically, you know, our clients, researchers, nonprofits, sustainable companies, 
provide real research that they care about that is aligned with their mission or if they're a researcher, this is their research. They provide stories, actual data and uh, career connections and then provide, that didn't animate correctly, that was the reverse. <laughs> so um, they will provide real learning um, and then we will then provide metrics of outreach and impact to these organizations so they can you know, basically uh, talk about all the great things that they've done for the world in spreading their realm of knowledge. And in many cases, um, you know, it, it, it's also benefiting their cause through greater awareness and understanding. So let's break down these client segments. Um, researchers are, you know, if you're a basic researcher, the National Science Foundation is the main funder uh, to the tune of $6 billion in grants yearly. And um, approximately seven to 10% of these, of each of these grants can go towards broader impacts. Uh, just, these are just kind of commonly accepted rules. So that's an approximately $600 million available market for researchers. Um, there are a lot of STEM education, health and conservation organizations um, that have important outreach needs. Um, so making some reasonable conservative assumptions, I arrive at a $611 million available market for nonprofits. Although I think some of you familiar with the nonprofit world will um, immediately think, well, nonprofits are often pretty cash strapped, but you know, they're, so this number is pretty hard to estimate actually. Um, I think, you know, obviously nonprofits can apply for grants. And so it's just a matter of, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and offering a service may open up a lot of uh, partnerships with nonprofits that wouldn't otherwise be there. But there are also huge uh, nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy that has like a billion dollars in holdings. Um, sustainable brands, um, many of you may be aware of B Corps and other social enterprises. These are for profit, but they have a stated mission, which uh, includes, you know, balancing their profits with societal and environmental benefit. Um, and so increasingly, people are coming to terms with the fact that, um, you know, uh, our current uh, measures of productivity are destroying the planet at a very rapid pace. And so, um, organizations are, well, for-profit companies are in many cases motivated to um, at least be seen as um, doing societal good. And part of that could be disseminating knowledge to the public. So as a proof of concept, um, I have a paper which just came out this month about um, neglected female song and barn swallows is sort of continuing some of my PhD research. Um, and so, it offers um, all the things I was just talking about in terms of uh, authentic data and a real personal narrative and basically just raw numbers to be the basis of uh, interdisciplinary lessons. So I've been working on this a lot. We got a small grant from the Animal Behavior Society that runs the journal where it's being published um, to fund this. I'll just show a little clip of a video that I made that um, was actually part of the um, video supplement to the paper, but we've also been working on uh, videos that tie more directly into the lesson. Uh, to play.
so you can watch that video on our website if you're interested. Um, but basically, you know, this is used as a hook to get students interested in uh, an, in an interesting phenomenon that's tied into cutting edge science um, and provides the basis for uh, concreting these abstract lessons that they would be learning just by you know repetition or just doing some kind of arbitrary task on a, on a worksheet. So uh, here I've created a custom animation that shows the connections between you know how data can be represented different ways um, and you know so in sixth grade they're supposed to learn about histograms anyway. So here it's embedded in a real lesson where they're playing around with um, authentic data from this current study. So I've also been developing a workflow. I mean, it's very clear now that we need to be able to deploy in different, uh, you know, in-person versus remote formats. Um, you never know when a pandemic is going to break out, but, you know, more important, I mean, more broadly, you, this could be useful um, when a teacher just can't be there for whatever reason. Um, and instead of just giving them busy work with a sub, they could uh, do a student paced lesson remotely. Um, and so I found a way to do that using a platform called Nearpod, which if anybody's teaching in this uh, during, you know, these COVID times, uh, Nearpod is definitely worth checking out. Um, so is our content better? We've been working on a lesson. Um, I'll kind of show you a bit of that later, but um, here's what a homeschool teacher had to say. This is a fantastic lesson. I love how it com combines actual research and allows students to see and understand the scientific process in action. Love it. Here's what an 11th grade student who did the project or did the lesson said, I was able to understand the purpose of histograms. The questions and activities were fun to do and it was much more interesting to complete than the regular questions we usually have to answer. And we've had students uh, from fourth grade all the way up to 11th grade do this. Um, and so we have multiple versions that we're creating to um, you know, differentiate um, those different age groups. I have a case study of another one of my lessons that um, it's based on uh, connecting a, another, a different math concept um, to a current study, um, someone else's work. And we show 43% uh, long-term learning improvement on, a, on an assessment from a two-day lesson um, over 223 days. So um, I think there's pretty strong evidence that we're doing something differently. Um, our team is me doing a lot of, wearing a lot of different hats. Um, and we have a volunteer and sort of contract based team at the moment. Um, hoping to change that in the future, get some full time people in. So the timeline for GP is currently uh, September, October, we're trying to uh, refine a publishing format and workflow. So I mean, this means um, how do you even how are your lessons organized? How, you know, what are all the graphic design rules for every step? You know, what, what are the list of elements that need to go in? How do you back them up? How do you share them? How do you connect with your team? How do you, um, you know, contract different segments out? You know, there's a lot of complex logistics that have, that need ironing out. Um, and so, you know, that's going to be ongoing um, in November, December. I want to have a social media push where, you know, once I get my website fully fleshed out, um, trying to grow uh, excitement around what I'm trying to do. And part of that is tied to getting a blog up and running and, and being able to drive some site, some site traffic. Um, at the end of, well, beginning of February, I'm going to be leaving Vanderbilt and running Galactic Polymath full time. So um, that's the end of the runway. So got to make sure that I'm ready to fly at that point. Um, so uh, March through April, um, basically going to be hopefully fulfilling contracts. So I'm hoping that, you know, the media push and the full launch, uh, you know, in the new year, I'll be able to uh, have some consistent work going forward and uh, deciding whether to continue organic growth. You know, I'm considering doing an Indiegogo or Kickstarter um, to, you know, get awareness out there um, about the service I'm trying to offer. Um, and, you know, get some funding for a few you know, open access projects. I think some, you know, I think a, a fair number of people will be excited about that idea. Um, so I'll just focus on where we are right now um, with refining the publishing format. So current publishing platforms uh, cost teachers. So a lot of things, you know, you have to pay to subscribe. Um, but whether they are, uh, 
you know, for whether you have to pay, whether it's paywalled or if it's open access, they're often just PDFs or static formats that don't get updated and you'll find a lot of broken, uh, unsupported uh, lessons out there. Um, they don't allow for portable remixable formats. So the teacher's kind of stuck with the way it is and that may lead them to not use it at all. Um, there may be a lot of hosted content that's of low or variable quality, which kind of sucks time, time from uh, highly constrained teachers. Um, they're not in, interdisciplinary. So like basically there have been calls since the eighties for interdisciplinary education and pushing um, like it doesn't make sense to teach science without math and vice versa or any of them without, you know, the ELA, you know, English language or linguistic tie-ins and, you know, social studies is often stuck and, and uh, has been kind of, um, you know, relictual um, in the, during the whole STEM push. So social studies is just like really neglected despite the fact that, you know, societies and history and technology all influence every other subject. So it's all tied together, but there's just not uh, very much not very much truly interdisciplinary uh, lessons out there. Um, and you'll look at these sites and you will wonder, does anybody actually use this? Because they're not, there's not like an active learning community and there's um, often not even a functionality um, for like, you know, would you buy an Amazon product that didn't have any reviews? Um, you wouldn't. So uh, I think the community aspect is also missing and, and should be an important piece. So let's talk about lessons. So uh, lessons, as I you know, mentioned, they're just boring. It's just no beating around the bush. Um, they're often hard to vet because there's so many different outlets and the lesson plans are not necessarily laid out in an intuitive way. So it can take a long time to even visualize what it's trying to do. And again, this adds to the motivation for teachers to just scrap it and just make their own stuff because it takes so long to even figure out, you know, what is good out there and how it aligns to their classroom. Um, and they're often hard to implement. The documentation can just be like really, really long and not well explained, um, not interdisciplinary. Sometimes they're just straight up incorrect. They're, and, and very often they're broken and not updated uh, and really, really boring. <laughs> so as a, as a case study, let's look at an exemplary science unit. So um, the next generation science standards have been pushed out to the majority of states and they're, they're pretty widely adopted. They're considered really strong um, set of standards, you know, learning standards for science that you know, include the teaching of evolution and climate change, for example, um, in no uncertain language. And this uh, organization Achieve, which was involved with writing the Next Generation of Science Standards, they've also created this, actually Achieve is no longer around, I don't know if anybody cares about this, but um, a different organization kind of absorbed them. Um, so there still is this badging certification where they go through a peer review process and people, and, and, and um, they can earn a badge. So this is one of those materials that went through this like really long building and testing and validation process. Um, and it's uh, basically a unit that's trying to teach how can we, so it's, it's driven around this essential question of how can we sense so many different sounds from a distance? And so this is um, supposed to be around sound, like a phenomenon uh, based lesson. But if you download the, the unit, you get uh, nine static PDF un, uneditable files. And this one alone, that's the teacher plus guides. I don't really know what the plus means. It's the teacher guides, basically. Um, it's 277 pages. So collectively, these documents are 510 static PDF pages. Um, so imagine just downloading that and trying to vet that. Like that's that's a lot. They're all they're also really really dense. Um, and then this is how it's like explained. Like it has these different bins where they are trying to address different things. Like how do you how do different objects make sounds? Uh, how do sound, how does sound travel um, and number of class periods. And so you have these complicated tables that you're trying to synthesize with how they map onto standards. Like this bend addresses these things. It's very complicated uh, from a teacher pract practitioner uh, standpoint. Um, if you look at how the students are experiencing it. So here they're asked the graphs to the right represent the position of sound source that is vibrating the sound source in each case is a xylophone. So you can imagine somebody striking it with a mallet. What can you claim about the sound that was made by hitting a xylophone in each case, 
based on the three graphs to the right. Why do you think that? That is not an interesting question, in my opinion. So even the real world examples are too abstract for students. Imagine somebody hitting a xylophone, what can you conclude? That is not interesting. Um, so now let's take, uh, take out your student increment model packet and record the consensus model this, the class decided on today to explain how we were able to hear different sounds from across the room. Let's think more about some other times. So think about times that you have experienced hearing different sounds from a distance. Let's use these experiences to try and generate a list of phenomena involving sound that we also want to try to explain in our unit. That is incredibly verbose and really boring. So if this is what science is, it's not for me. Like I'm a scientist and I don't even, I'm not even remotely interested in that exercise. Um, so the GP way is, you know, more about like active storytelling. So what, what is the story? What is the narrative that is gonna engage students um, and, you know, in answering the question in the same way that scientists themselves are driven to answer, you know, these sort of gaps in our knowledge base. Um, making it interdisciplinary. So like by aligning two standards and in, in each subject, we can actually generate these graphics that show how, like in a concrete way, how interdisciplinary it is. Um, and with a, you know, for the last several months, I've been developing a prototype um, that just got back from a um, graphic designer who kind of discarded some of my ideas. But um, basically, what I'm trying to do is create a format that is like well, well considered, as concise as possible. Sorry, my dog is drinking water right now. It's kind of loud. Um, you know, that, that, you know, has everything in a natural order that is clearly versioned, that tells you, okay, this has been updated, um, you know, that basically has all the pieces there um, and makes it as easy as possible to teach, including graphics that show like how each step fits into your class period. Um, and, you know, with a way to deploy this in a shareable remixable format, open access, uh, Creative Commons license format uh, using Google Slides, and then uh, with the potential to remotely deploy with Nearpod, which has a free tier that does a lot. Um, and then I've been creating this, uh, this um, sorry, I just lost it there, um, graphic that, you know, basically based on our standards alignment can, can visualize what areas of knowledge this, uh, um, this lesson is attempting to, to teach at a glance. Um, so I've been really putting a lot of thought of this and, and developing a workflow that's based on um, kind of best practices and teaching, trying to learn about that myself because um, at the CSEO, we don't often have to think about standards. And so we had to learn about uh, backwards design and um, uh, understanding by design and basically like how these we should write questions and, and design assessments for these standards alignments as we're building the lesson. Um, so it's not an afterthought. We're actually building interdisciplinary lessons from the outset, which is really not something that, that people are doing. Um, so um, that's a prototype. So that's kind of where we are. That is a graphic prototype in uh, Adobe XD. So um, clearly that's needs to be coded. So the next step will be once I finish getting feedback from teachers and practitioners, um, I need to hire somebody to make that make that real. Um, and then that will be the template that for publishing going forward. Um, okay, so there's a lot of challenges um, with what I'm trying to do. There's some obvious things that many of you are also facing. So just org structure. I went back and forth about like nonprofit versus LLC. And you find there, there are important distinct, distinctions, but it's increasingly blurry because you can have companies that are kind of both and different wings are uh, for-profit versus nonprofit. I went with LLC because it's a simple framework. It's pretty flexible. Um, if I ever want to get investment, uh, you know, it, it's con conducive to that. Um, you know, I, I can't apply for grant money, but because of the nature of my um, service based company, um, I think there's a pretty good alignment for people to write grants who can 
um, and then subcontract me out. So it just made sense for me, I think. We'll see. <laughs> um, so funding, obviously, I just touched on that a little bit. Uh, personnel is, especially in the beginning, it's always going to be easier if you just kind of naturally have a relationship or stumble into a co-founder relationship where you have at least two people invested. Um, I don't have that. I'm basically just doing everything myself and trying to recruit some, some people who are willing to pitch in in the early stages since, you know, I can't, I can't really pay people much or anything at this point. So just being able to um, share the load, I mean, early on is, is huge. And I know a lot of you are struggling with that. Um, if you're interested in talking about that, like I know of a, a few strategies for, for finding people that have been good. Um, defining the product, uh, I'll touch on this a little more in a second, but that, you know, this is, this has been a struggle too, because I think I can get across the vision for what I want to do and like, you know, how I want to connect research and like, you know, groups that want to, but can't reach out to K-12, uh, right, right now. Um, but like, what exactly am I am I doing? Um, and so I think this lesson preview is really essential. You know, currently the lesson delivery format is just a Google Doc. You know, and nobody, no matter how how good it is or how well thought out it is, you know, no one's ever going to get that excited about a Google Doc. Um, so having a format that you know conveys production value is really important, um, and that's something that takes a lot of time as well, and ex you know, multiple expertises to to get out. Marketing, um, you know, it's just it's really important. And as scientists, we're kind of like we have the opposite education in marketing. Like, you know, you should not value your skills. You should work on weekends. You should work on holidays, and like not worry about getting paid ever. Um, <laughs> And, you know, like, I, basically we have to unlearn a lot of the lessons from being an academic um, in order to be a successful business person. Um, and marketing is really essential. People need to know about what you're doing and it's not easy to break, for, to break through all the noise. Um, not knowing how to run a business, like I said, touched on that. Uh, yeah, legal, you know, form, forming the LLC, uh, contract language is just really sticky, like invoicing, the whole back office, like financial management, all that stuff is, I didn't know anything about that. I still know very little about it. It's tough. Um, just what systems are you going to create to uh, build and sustain your content um, and to be able to work uh, relatively quickly and also, you know, be able to scale once you, you know, ideally, hopefully, um, you know, just catch fire and start taking off. Like, um, you don't want to like have to go back and like rebuild your whole site or your whole workflow. Um, but you can also trying to future proof everything, trying to think through every detail you can just, um, you know, just don't let, uh, um, perfect be the enemy of good. So um, there's also technical web development. I can talk a lot about that if you're interested. Um, that's a huge piece. Um, so those are all the obvious things <laughs> that you're like, these are what, you know, we might call the known knowns. Then there's the unknown unknowns, or maybe those are the known unknowns. These are the unknown unknowns. So, um, if you build it, they may not come. So I think starting out, we all have kind of a vision for what we're doing and how we want to do it, but um, we need to constantly be reassessing and validating those assumptions. And it's often tricky, especially like, you know, for my particular example, I'm kind of going on a lot of faith based on my personal relationships and my experience with science and broader impacts and kind of like the trade winds of, you know, the direction of science, like towards open access and towards science communication. I see there being a huge need for this to simplify and magnify the efforts of scientists to communicate their work. It's not enough to know your elevator pitch. It doesn't matter how well you know your elevator pitch if you don't have an audience. So 
building infrastructure to get that to get those messages out is essential. Um, but like I say, that's my assumption. So I don't know if there's a market for it. And I don't, if there is a market, I don't know how much people are willing to pay for this kind of consulting. So in order for it to be functional, I have to be able to charge like, you know, 20K or 10K per job to be able to pay for it. myself, contractors, all of the things that go into it um, that you don't necessarily fully appreciate at the beginning. Um, defining minimum and minimum viable product, people are just saying like, you know, start selling, you know, like, don't worry about getting it perfect. Um, but you know, what is minimum? So like, <laughs> at what point is it, is it good enough to be considered even a minimum viable product? This is sort of a philosophical question, but, um, should be an ongoing examination. Uh, something that I didn't really expect is resistance from within. So within the science communication, uh, especially the education outreach community, um, I've found a certain amount of resistance because in many ways, my message is not that uplifting. Um, it's basically saying, we need to professionalize this and what you're doing is invaluable. <laughs> and that's not what I'm trying to say. Um, people who have been spending, you know, a decade or more doing outreach and like building relationships with teachers, like, I think that is incredible. And, you know, you've undoubtedly made um, contributions to people's lives and, you know, enriched people's experiences and, and probably changed their, you know, changed the trajectory of their lives full stop. Um, but on, you know, another way of looking at it is that it's not scalable and like we need larger infrastructure. Like it's not just people living in the cities where these universities are doing broader impacts that deserve access to this stuff. Like every kid deserves access to this cutting edge knowledge. Like why, like we're doing trickle down education where, you know, we're just waiting for this knowledge to percolate down through, you know, the, the scientific journal, the press release, then go out to the Atlantic and scientific American until eventually somebody makes a little documentary about it, you know, and eventually your uncle will tell you about a fact that's interesting and maybe engage you in like, what seven gill sharks are and you know their whole thing you know like we need more direct mechanisms like let's talk to young people about climate change old people have made up their minds about it and they're hard they're really dug in so anyway i'll, I'll, I'll get off that um managing people is a huge huge challenging problem i can talk about that uh, um <laughs> even you know perhaps especially volunteers um can be really challenging to manage. And that's kind of where, where you're stuck early on, but you know, you're asking a lot of people for free. And so like, it's a, it's a tightrope to like try to provide definite expectations while acknowledging that like, they're not necessarily getting, like they're not being compensated what they're worth, right? So that's kind of tough. Okay, so I've talked long enough um, uninterrupted. So please get in touch if you're interested. Um, I don't know why that's in mode. Weird. Um, it's great, Brad. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe the slides up, people can, you know, point to them or something. Um, there was a question from Sarah. Um, Sarah, do you want to ask away? Okay. Sure. So I am in like the STEM education world, and I'm really interested in all the stuff that you're doing. Um, but I am curious what you see as your role or GP's role in either collaborating or doing things separate from STEM education folks who are already trying to do a lot of like professional development and lesson plan creation with teachers um, and like trying to do this community aspect, like making a community of teachers that they're working with. So how do you see? Yeah, good question. I mean, I would, I want i i crave teachers to use this content and tell me how it's working and how it's not and like basically you know what i want to do is make make it really easy for teachers to connect to current research and real data sets and just to like make that work easy and you know so like i i would love to you know connect with um, professional development networks and you know to just use this content and and recognize that like we are really invested in making it work and making it quality. 
um, and, and taking the feedback and incorporating it and actively versioning the lessons. Um, so, uh, and, you know, and, and if teachers want to fork it, you know, to make it their own, like, uh, it's, you know, it's all open access stuff. So like, you know, um, PD could involve like taking this lesson that works this way and then, you know, changing it to work, you know, like we, we, we initially designed it to work with jigsaw, but, you know, you can do it with centers or, you know, um, basically, I mean, we're not like, I want to make teachers lives easier and, um, and to make student experiences richer. Um, so I think our goals are definitely aligned and I would love to work with you if you want to um, talk further about that. Yeah, that, that helps as, as someone who's researching this and like all of this aligns with my dissertation research, which is really interesting. Um, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you. You should definitely email. talk. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, any other questions? Um, th there was a lot in there, Matt. Um, amazing. <laughs> uh, Thanks. Yeah, feel free um, to ask. I, ha I had a question. Go ahead, Umi. It's it's a little unrelated. Like, so you mentioned you uh, collaborate with Sai on these projects. So how how does th that work? What? Oh yeah, what's our collaboration? It was uh, SAI. I think she's saying about our collaboration with SAI. Like, yeah. You, you mentioned earlier about you know collaborating with nonprofits, so maybe to right. subcontract it out. How do you see that collaboration in other nonprofits as well? Yeah, I mean, basically any nonprofit, like let's say the American Heart Association, right? They care about cardiac health, and I think you know they struggle. They often every nonprofit is struggling to get their message out to the public, um, and you know K twelve is a place where students are just being fed a lot of dry material. All the time and I'm and this is very I mean this is a huge oversimplification like there are amazing teachers and there's great content right but um yeah but amazing teachers without great content is kind of useless yes right I I, I would just say like the the content is extremely variable and you can't have too much uh -huh. content and we just want to be the source of a source of good content straight mm -hmm. from the progenitors of knowledge or stakeholders and a body of knowledge. So like the American Heart Association could be potential funder, you know, Nature Conservancy, like you would just, you would find um, some body of knowledge and then align, you know, the key conclusions that they want to convey to their public. Like just imagine a person growing up with an understanding of, you know, what leads to myocardial infarctions or, you know, the, impl the broader implications of poor regulation of plastic waste, you know, um, how would you design, so basically just aligning that with different lessons using real data sets and real stories and, and narrative storytelling. Um, yeah, and, and I will add, you can be very creative, you know, I think to ask the first part about SAI collaboration, you know, uh, the GP way, and Matt, I love that, the GP way. I think yeah. I should title this presentation is that it's something that within SAI could be um, like a grant that Matt writes, exactly right. And, and so for, for my end, it would be, how do we support him to get that work out, right? And so it's a fine line where you work, um, some grants will allow you to stipulate that a portion of this project will be like generating income, for example, right? So, so you have to find the right grant that will allow you to, to pitch it as a, like a dual thing, right? There's the grant side of it, you get money to project, but then the project, if it succeeds to, to make it sustainable, right, then you can have this revenue stream as well. I think it totally works. And, and, and that's why I'm really just excited to continue and, and, and support the GP way. <laughs> just possible, okay. Uh, Danielle, question. Yeah, um, so for the, the CS, um, the CSEO fellowships that you mentioned, are these things that are like posted for individual uh, like fellowships, or do you contact the office and then they share with you the openings they have? Um, it's just generally on a rolling basis. Um, there's not like a season, but I can tell you, I know about one job that's opening up in February. <laughs> Fine. So um, if you want to work with middle schoolers, um, let me know. Um, but generally, like if you reach out to Jennifer Ufnar, 
I can provide her email. If you, if you email me, um, you know, I, I can provide you any details or a virtual introduction or whatever. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that'd be really useful because, uh, yeah, I'm just interested in working more with, um, I'm not sure, do you guys do a lot with like high school students? Like similar to what you were saying, like you think back on when you were in school, but then you don't necessarily know exactly what's going on in the classroom. <clears throat> so it sounds like it'd be like a really good fit for trying to get more involved, like in the school actually. Yes, so, and as I said, these are uh, postdocs, so they're NIH pay scale, so they're well supported postdocs, um, but they're per year, but you can, um, re you can renew them. Um, so I've been, this is my third and a half year, uh, and they're cutting me off. Um, <laughs> that's fine. I'm excited about it. Um, anyway, we have two high school programs. One is the ISR, Interdisciplinary uh, Science Research Program. So that one's embedded in, I think we have four, three different high schools that we're involved with. So you would be at the high school. And then um, there's the SSMV, which is the School for Science and Math at Vanderbilt. And that is for advanced high schoolers. It's a four-year program, highly competitive. Um, and these students are actually working on campus, but yeah, those are both really cool programs. And as I mentioned last week, the LLC, you can apply for grants directly as a for-profit um, entity. NSF has a whole bunch. You just have to read the stipulations as to who is eligible. So I spent a lot of my time reading the eligibility box and finding out, you know, hey, uh, is this only for higher, not just nonprofits, but higher education institutions, for example, right? And sometimes they may say just nonprofit is fine. And then they may have a stipulation for profit is fine, but then here's a disclaimer that you need to be blah, 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 right? You just have to read the fine print. And, and so I spent a lot of time reading, uh, just trying to get the details. And a lot of this is just dotting the I's, you know, cross the T's and, and, and Matt, you're nodding your head. I think that's really, you know, he's been working on this. You mentioned three years, Matt, GP? Yeah. More or so? I mean, in some form or other, yeah, for like three years. Yeah, yeah, and and so it's it's a it's been a side hustle for a while, and now it's going to be the real gig, right, in February. And that's <laughs> yeah, probably. yeah, running the runway here, but uh, um, but but yeah. Uh, any other questions uh, for Matt? So you mentioned that you are, um, you know, one of the possible big, I don't know, um, customers, I guess, I don't know, um, for GP would be people that have NSF grants because that way you can help them fulfill their broader impact. How are you planning to connect with them? Are you planning to like email specific universities like the Office for Research or something like that? Or are you hoping that when you start creating a media presence, they're going to come to you? Yeah, I mean, probably a mixture. I at first um, just try to drive as much attention to what I'm doing as possible. So, um, you know, like I said, I, I want to start a blog and then hopefully generate some excitement on Twitter and get people sharing this. Um, but uh, I also mentioned that Eris Award. Um, so they have a huge network and, and part of that award is they're going to try to support my, um, my company. So I want to take advantage of that relationship and hopefully get a lot of, I mean, increasingly there are these broader impact centers popping up around the country. And so like connecting with the, these nodes will be really key, I think, and getting them to, you know, point their researchers to, like these teams that like make it easier. I mean, ideally I want to make broader impacts both easier and orders of magnitude more impactful. Um, so I think that's a pretty good value prop for busy researchers who have enough hats already. Yeah, and I think the ecosystem is massive, right? The, the stakeholders here are museums and scientists and mm -hmm. companies, as you were mentioning them, I think. Um, you clearly have thought this through and are still thinking it through, right? Uh, testing your assumptions. <laughs> right. right? Testing. Um, and you will get new data as you test these assumptions, you will find actually that doesn't work. You know, I have to tweak it for this way. And I love when you said, I want to get feedback, right, from teachers using the GP yeah. way and yeah. telling us. Uh,
the trainees from the beginning, like talk to the users, yeah. get, get that feedback um, as early as possible before you really, really commit <laughs> uh, to the work. Uh, and so with that, thank you, Matt, so much. That was uh, fantastic. Um, I see people clapping, yay, virtual claps. Um, please get in touch with Matt if you wanna chat some more um, yes. and, and learn more about what he's doing. Check out his website. Did you put your website earlier, right? Um, I will. We will. Okay. Um, because he just recently launched it and he's still revamping it. Um, yeah, totally overhaul it actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There it is, Matt at Galactic Polymath. Oh, that's your email, right? Yeah. Yeah, galacticpolymath.com. Yeah, we'll get you to that. And so I hope you're appreciating slowly we, as we're taking this journey through now, um, we're digging deep into some of these individual organizations and exploring, for example, here, Matt beautifully laid out his thinking and all the elements along the way as he's trying to figure out that uh, problem solution fit right to to understanding and figure out the business model as well that makes sense you can totally make and you should be able to think about making money in this too there's nothing wrong with that and that was right you have to unlearn all these things yeah yes <laughs> they are there they're heard like oh i shouldn't ask for money like you can totally think of it and try to find yeah value right value added and value costs something right um and so next week we'll take another deep dive um, with Pete Fulbrecht and his, and his uh, initiative um, that he's building. And uh, yeah, um, hopefully you guys have a good day and we'll be chatting some more soon in your individual chats. Okay, and if you haven't talked to me yet, please make sure you've signed up, okay? Um, if you haven't, for those of most of you have I think reached out, but if you haven't, please do so.